Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you all. My name is Piro Turki and I am the director of ISTC, Lille Institute of Communication Studies in the north of France. On behalf of all the ISTC's team, I am really pleased and very honored to welcome you all to this keynote lecture this afternoon to conclude three intense and fascinating days and our series of communication and media research lecture about the re-evaluations and the applications of Professor Manuel Castell's concept of the network society. This has been a special week and a landmark event for us because we've just all together experienced the first international academic conference hosted by the new and young CCMR, the Center of Communication and Media Research of ISTC. So many thanks to all of you for joining our keynote even this afternoon and for being part of the development of our research activity. I am delighted to announce that ISTC is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. It is certainly a sign of youth, but it is also a significant indication of maturity in the sector of media and communication, which has been undergoing a profound, intense and enormous change for many years. Since 1991, we've pursued academic excellence and practical experience to prepare our students for communication and media studies or for careers in the field of communication and marketing. We try to empower responsible actors with remarkable skills in the field of communication, actors who are able to understand and to anticipate the structural evolutions of our contemporary world and to make an impact in the organizations or in the society. Of course, it's also important for us to be able to generate meaningful content to stimulate awareness about the ethical and societal implications of the information society. And lastly, one of our aims is to be focused, whether outside or inside academia, on the generation of new scientific knowledge that we hope will be beneficial to the community of communication and media studies. For all those reasons, we believe, of course, that it is vital for ISTC to develop an ambitious and fruitful academic research activity. We know that these things are planned on a long-term basis, but the two last days have been an important step toward that goal. I wish to extend my gratitude to everyone for your participation and for your interest in this crucial matter for ISTC. In a few minutes, Mehdi Gassemi, our head of research, will have the privilege to introduce today's speaker Professor Manuel Castells. Professor, I would like to thank you for honoring us with your presence this afternoon to conclude our conference with a highly anticipated keynote lecture on the Network Society Revisited. The, announce the announcement of your presence and your participation have played a major role in the success of our conference. Again, my gratitude to you, Professor. It is now time for me to hand the stage over to our Head of Research, Mr. Mehdi Gassemi. Mehdi is going to outline the main motivations which have prompted the organization of our conference. He will summarize in a few words the reasons why the work of Professor Castells is truly inspirational for our research activities here at ISTC. As a conclusion, I would like to thank all those who have contributed to the successful organization of our conference Thank you, Mehdi. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you all. Mehdi, please do us the honor of presenting and welcoming Professor Manuel Castells. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a very stimulating keynote lecture. Uh, thank you, Pierrot. I don't know if the camera, should I wait for the camera to turn? Or it can start. Okay, very good. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Castells, welcome to our keynote event. My name is Mehdi Gassemi, and I am head of research here at the Lille Institute of Communication Studies. On behalf of my colleagues here at ISTC, I have the honor to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Manuel Castells, the Wallace Annenberg Chair Professor in Communication Technology and Society at the University of Southern California. Professor Castells was born in Spain in 1942. He studied law and economics at the University of Barcelona before moving to Paris where he pursued his studies. He started his academic career at Paris Nanterre at the age of 25, where he became involved in some of the events of the uh, May 68, May 1968. 
In fact, uh, Daniel Combendit, uh, one of the most active uh, young people in those days, who later became member of the EU Parliament representing France, was a student of Professor Castells in that period. Professor Castells later joined the Ecole des Autres Études uh, Sociales, uh, where he emerged as one of the founders of what later became known as the field of urban sociology. Uh, in 1979, he moved to UC Berkeley, where he was appointed professor of sociology uh, and city and regional planning. The results of the research he conducted during that period were later published in the truly groundbreaking trilogy, The Information Age, which we know all very well. It was this trilogy that really established the term the network society as a true paradigm shift, as well as a conceptual framework to understand the digital transformation although the term had been present and had been around for a while. As one of the world's leading social scientists, Professor Castells has had one of the longest, most prolific careers in academia. He has written over 30 books. If I'm not mistaken, Professor Castells, it's 32, um, or maybe 33 coming up. Uh, in French, English, and Spanish, as well as hundreds of articles. He has lectured in over 50 uh, oh, sorry, 40 countries and at hundreds of academic institutions worldwide. Among the numerous awards and distinctions, which I won't be able to list all, obviously, he was appointed at the European Academy, was a member of the EU Commission High-Level Expert Group on the Information Society, and since 2008, uh, he has been member of the Governing Board of the European Institute of Technology. In 2012, uh, he was awarded the Holberg Memorial Prize, which is awarded by the Norwegian government to outstanding scholars for their work in the arts, humanities, and the social sciences. He has, he has, he has also been advisor to the UNESCO, the EU Commission, the International Labour Office, United Nations Development Program, and several other prestigious international organizations, as, many, uh, as well as many governments uh, around the world, including, including the French government. We are proud to have hosted a three-day conference on Professor Skelsell's work, and we sincerely thank him for his generosity towards our very young Center for Communication and Media Research, with honoring us with his present, uh, presence with us today. I could go on and on, obviously, with my introduction and still fail to list all, all of Professor Castells' achievements. And I know Professor Castells is running an extremely tight schedule with all his commitments and all uh, everything that he's doing at the moment. And that you, the audience, uh, are here really to, to listen to Professor Castells and not me. So I will cut this presentation short. And without further delay, please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Professor Manuel Castells. Good afternoon. Glad to be with you. And very grateful to ISTC for uh, organizing this event to critically assess um, the theory and practice of the network society. Um, you know that um, I will uh, always consider that for me theory is a tool, is an instrument to produce knowledge and through knowledge to improve uh, the sorry state of the world. That was the case and continues to be the case. And in that sense, um, that's what I will try to do today, uh, to uh, evaluate and in, in view of current events and recent events, how the network society theory helps or doesn't help us um, in guiding our knowledge and our action. Um, in fact, in, in 2010, was published a new edition of the many editions that this uh, trilogy has had, and I wrote a preface to this uh, 2010 edition, um, in which I tried to, uh, again, at that point, evaluate the usefulness or not of the theory by uh, surveying the events that had taken place between 2000, the, the date of final publication of the uh, trilogy, and 2010. 
to some extent and in much briefer terms, I will um, do the same, try to do the same today. What, how the network society theory renders, provides intelligibility to what we have been experienced in the last decade. A very intense decade, by the way. Um, simply, uh, it reminds you the, the essence that, uh, of what is the network society. This is the concept that tries to um, understand the social structure of our age, which many call, and I call the information age, it's a concept that it would be parallel to what we used to do with the industrial society concept. That was not about the industry, it was about the social structure. And because the network society, as it was the industrial society, um, refers to uh, a global social structure. The network society is, in essence, global, because networks do not have boundaries do not acknowledge boundaries. Uh, because of that, it actually refers to all societies at, its, at their nucleus. Although uh, this, uh, with extreme cultural and institutional uh, diversity. So it is a nucleus, which is the network society, and many different variations and, some, and extremely um, opposite consequences and logics, depending on the cultural, historical, institutional diversity. The Denver Society, just to, that, that simply to, to, to prevent any confusion, uh, does not supersede capitalism. On the contrary, it actually powers and accelerates the logic of capitalism in many, many situations. It's different. It's a fundamental common nucleus that cuts across different societies and institutions. Not everybody is included in the network society, uh, because remember that networks include and exclude at the same time. But the exclusion is also a derivative of the logic of the network inclusion. So I will start by referring uh, descriptively first to the changes in the theory uh, while at the same time and showing the continuity of some of the key aspects. The first is that um, today we can observe that internet-based social networks um, and organizational networks as platforms of sociability and every activity have spread all over the world. And as well as the full digitization of all the core society, activities of our societies. This has been, there has been a wide extreme expansion and acceleration of the logic of digital networks everywhere. This is part of what was uh, included in the theory, although I never made predictions, but clearly goes in continuity what, what we have been researching 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I would say, uh, I remind you some uh, key figures on the matter, we are approaching about 5 billion internet users in the world, and also uh, very significant, even more significant, uh, we have uh, at least um, uh, 7 billion, a planet of 7.6 billion, we have 7 billion of um, uh, mobile devices, uh, to, to, to mobile phones and others, uh, numbers, not devices, numbers. So this about over 50%, close to, to 55% now, are the so-called smartphones, that is a computer on a phone. So it means that the planet is largely, uh, with great disparities and great inequalities, but it's largely, we are uh, connected digitally uh, in almost the entire population. Um, the, 
we now have entered into a new set, into a new stage of acceleration of this uh, networking and digitization of society by uh, the spread of the connectivity technology uh, that we know as 5G and 6G is right there, which is not simply more, it's qualitatively different in every way, um, in volume, uh, speed, uh, latency. And, and at the same time, uh, this whole network system is being powered more and more by artificial intelligence, which is the other major transformation, which finally has come of age after decades of science fiction and hype. In this massive networking that has happened in the last 20 years, uh, which is in historical terms is still very recent, remember that before uh, 2002 there were no what we call now social networks, so, uh, social media networks as, as ways of communication. Uh, the first social media network that was created in San Francisco in 2002, for instance, uh, Facebook was 2004, and so on and so on. Um, so remember, this is barely, barely uh, two decades uh, of the gigantic um, networking of all our activities and the building of a hypertext to everybody connecting for every information or analysis be uh, commercial, political, uh, cultural, uh, geopolitical, etc. Under such conditions, social movements had been transformed and powered. And so had been uh, counter social movements. I have followed closely these transformations. That's the, the theme of uh, another book that I wrote a few years ago, like five years ago, uh, Networks of Outrage and Hope. Um, that showed the importance of network for the social movement. Also, politics is transformed. Uh, media politics and information and politics have completely uh, modified the modus operandi of uh, the political actors and of the political system. This is something that uh, I analyze in detail in my book, Communication Power. Um, there has been Simultaneous, the process of transformation of space, of spatial forms and processes, which is linked to this logic of global networking and global concentration of territory in, in certain territories of population and activities, and uh, avoiding an exclusion of large spans of territory and population, uh, reconstructing marginality and exploitation within these mega metropolitan areas which constitute the new spatial form of the information age. Um, so this rise of mega urbanization together with the deepening of marginality is also another uh, consequence of this global network logic, which I have tried this one to analyze in my recent book uh, two years ago on uh, Latin America. And I'll titled The New Latin America. Um, in the meantime, the disintegration of traditional forms of organization and the crisis of institutional ability to respond to uh, the demands of a new exploited population and a new politically marginalized population had led to the breakdown in many countries of the social fabric and the uh, rise of violence as a way of life, which is ruled in most of the world and is rising even in uh, societies as uh, uh, constructed uh, and rooted in history and tradition at the European societies, which, by the way, I remind you that uh, we Europeans are now less than 6% of the world population, even if we continue to create, to believe uh, that we are the center of the universe. And as a direct relationship to this breakdown of the social fabric, we have seen the expansion of a gigantic global network criminal economy. Networks of criminal economy are also following a logic of networks 
without which we could not withstand the global spread and the influence from financial markets to political institutions uh, to social uh, life in the neighborhoods of the criminal economy. I also want to emphasize that together with this massive expansion of networks, there has been also an intensification of the resistance to these networks, to the resistance to the logic of these networks. On the one hand, resistance in terms of social movements that had used the networking logic and the networking form of organization, the social movements claiming the local, claiming the meaningful uh, activities and face-to-face -face and local cultures vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the abstract logic of the networks in the space of flows. Uh, but also, uh, together with these social movements, also had been, has been an increasing role in the resistance to the logical networks of uh, identity. One of my volumes uh, materials, as you may uh, know, titled The Power of Identity, and I identified that the counter trend was the logic of the network society, but the logic of the networks of identity and, uh, that were opposing to the logic, to the overwhelming logic of the instrumental network. Identity, religious identity particularly, but also gender identity, sexual identity, ethnic identity, national territorial identity, and as well as the individual construction of specific identities. All this goes into the logic, both elements that I have uh, called seeds series of events that I have described go entirely into the logic that was to some extent mapped out in analysis, although no in predictions in, in, the, in the theory of the network society. Um, but there have been changes and should be changes because a good theory has to adapt constantly to the emergence of new phenomena, a, a theory that doesn't change, a theory that is too rigid to understand new processes is not a theory could be an ideology, uh, but it's, it's not a theory. And I don't have, myself, what uh, Jean-Paul Sartre called the intellectual uh, vested interest, meaning I, I will not defend in my concept theories or analysis unless they are useful. And if not, uh, we should change. And I change, and I constantly change. Um, and I hope that exactly what you have been doing these days. The one key change in my theory is that as social media and social digital networks take over everything, new contradictions emerge precisely because of the existence of these social media and of these social networks. Um, and in that sense, I would call this movement uh, the end of innocence of what we were thinking and the original culture underlying my work, which is the culture of Silicon Valley, where this trilogy by and large uh, was nurtured, even if I tried to make it global and crisscross the wall uh, to um, uh, make, make sure that I understood the multidimensionality and multiculturalism of uh, the, this uh, network society. Uh, but in terms of the what has happened in social media, um, there are two major issues on which I want to, uh, to, to insist. On the one hand, um, the transformation of uh, the logic of social media into a new form of capitalism, uh, data, cap data capitalism, uh, we all had been um, transformed into commodities. Um, because the fact that we are all in the social media, that we all practice uh, social media, our information, our lives, our everything is in this uh, digital hypertext, in this digital panopticon, as I uh, call sometimes, which uh, is not a secondary aspect, it's the heart of the essence of the business, of the new business world. Uh, we used to say in Silicon Valley, if we don't pay for something, uh, it's because we are paying with our data. Now, 
On the other hand, uh, something different, uh, although not entirely unrelated, is that because we all are, and all our lives are <clears throat> in this digital uh, hypertext, in these digital social networks, for the first time, global state surveillance is possible and it's practice. And uh, we are constantly surveyed. Sometimes with good reasons, uh, we have to prevent terrorists, or we have to make sure that uh, uh, there is no spread of, of uh, epidemics, but the, the actual matter is that uh, we, for the first time in history, states have the technological capacity to identify everything that everybody does, where and when, with whom. Of course, both through um, a data capitalist logic and through the global surveillance logic, uh, the, the idea of privacy is simply a joke, as uh, uh, McNeely, the founder of some microsystems, said a long time ago. Uh, yes, we have laws and institutions, and uh, we could be protected by some of these laws, and this would be a, a constant struggle of civil rights, the new civil rights to privacy. Um, but yet, at the same time, remember that it's, there are constant ways in which this privacy can be reached, even with our consent. Yes, we can be, uh, we can reject it and not be in the network. By the way, uh, it's not so easy to find me in the networks. Um, but uh, because I was one of the first to use them and understand uh, their logic. Um, moreover, we are in a world of free communication. Free communication means, uh, free communication, remember, that is surveilled and commercialized, both. But it's free because it's, it's convenient. It's very convenient to be able to uh, commodify ourselves, and it's very convenient uh, to uh, know that everything can be observed. But there is free communication that most people, most organizations, most institutions, uh, most entities can actually intervene in this global space of communication and say, propose, argue, whatever. A, a global agora of multiple expressions, constantly, constantly, unrestricted, and, you, and we can navigate from one uh, side to the other of this uh, immense internet galaxy. Um, that, therefore, uh, has created a wall of information in which uh, everything coexists. Uh, great ability to acquire information, culture, the wonders of the human creativity, but also insults, also racism, sexism, uh, homophobic statements, nazism, colonialism, all the evils of humankind are now massively exposed and massively defended in the social media networks. And there is no way to, to counter this decisively because censorship is, is not an option for many people, including myself. But in addition, it's not very practical because it's extremely difficult to block the internet. You can do it for three or four days, as Egypt tried to do, uh, in 2011, when the uh, Paris Square uprising and the entire economy started to collapse from financial markets to tourism to uh, the way in which organizations are related in, a, uh, in, in daily business practices. So, in that sense, uh, fake news have emerged and distinguishable many cases from the 
traditional news. And uh, even the social, the, even the media, the traditional media, has been affected by these uh, epidemics of credibility. And in many cases, they have uh, adapted and adopted uh, many of these noise in the information world. I would say uh, that we are assisting not only because of media communication, the, the costs are deeper, but uh, media communication are a powerful instrument to spread the trend. We are what witnessing a new assault on reason. The disbelief in science, the disbelief in argument, the disbelief in reason uh, is to a large extent uh, the fundamental crisis of civility and also our increasing inability to truly communicate, to truly be together rather than trying to exterminate each other. Furthermore, in my book, Communication Power, I showed how empirically, how media politics, informational politics, and social media politics, all based on the destruction of the uh, credibility of the, um, of the political adversaries, have led to a fundamental crisis of legitimacy in liberal democracies, which I documented in another recent book, 2007, Rupture, the Crisis of Liberal Democracy, which is directly connected to the new form of media politics and, and is certainly connected to the spread of fake news, besides the inability of democratic institutions to respond effectively to the new demands of the new social movements. And this leads me to consider uh, the transformation and restatement, reorganization of a, a major institution in society, in all societies, the state. You know, I never believed in the supersession of the state proclaimed by globalization theories and neoliberals. Um, in fact, in my book, I emphasized uh, not the disappearance of the state, but in the, I mean, in the original liberal society, book, but uh, I referred to the formation of a new construction of the state. A state that, of course, I conceptualize as a network state, uh, of which the European Union has been the most uh, direct example, and therefore, you know, to what I am referring, and I will not elaborate further on this, uh, but there are other softer forms of network state, which are also, have also developed around the world. However, I, to some extent, we have in the new theoretical developments, we have to emphasize the increasing role of the state, not the decreasing role of the state, the increasing role of the state, that sometimes as a sole actor, using networks, yes, but not being taken by the networks in some cases. The state as an instance of domination continues to be at the forefront of society. Not only, is not powerless, as some people have predicted there in my case, but to some extent it is even more powerful than ever because it has reinvented itself in the network society and in the digital environment. As I said, surveillance is a key instrument and surveillance now is more powerful is more powerful for the domination of the state in the moment in which we are all in the digital panopticon. And in addition, I argue, has been built what I refer as a global surveillance 
network bureaucracy because all these major agencies uh, from uh, the uh, NSA American to the British to the French to the German and certainly in some cases cooperation with the Russian or the Chinese are connected, interconnected and not only for political reasons. Um, so the constitution of a global network surveillance bureaucracy is also part of the new state in the network society. And furthermore, the state has always been linked fundamentally to the possibility of military confrontation. And now it's um, this military strategies, this military confrontation could be devastating and even more difficult to counter in terms of uh, the preventing the violence. Concretely speaking, the spread of artificial intelligence and um, networks, digital networks, are creating on the one hand uh, a massive front line of cyber war, which is disrupting uh, by states or their proxies, fundamental institutions of our societies. And the spread of artificial intelligence has led to a massive uh, transformation of robotics. And therefore, the existence of uh, robots as a war machines that are already operational. This is not uh, Hollywood fantasies. In fact, Hollywood fantasies to some extent are not exactly fantasy in some cases because they get their ideas and information from very nearby uh, military complexes. Uh, for instance, the, the, the war strategies now are based on massive use of drones. Drones are the continuation of the autonomous vehicles um, logic and technology developed at DARPA, the Defense Department uh, Advanced Research Agency, uh, in 2004, which had led, on the one hand, to the autonomous vehicle that Google first and then Uber are uh, using, and that could certainly uh, be a, a part of our daily life once they sort out uh, with the insurance companies who pays what. Uh, who is responsible for destruction, accidents, deaths, etc., etc. That's what is halting this development. The rest is settled. Um, but on the other hand, the, um, this logic has spread, and now um, drones not only have intelligence capabilities, not only they have autonomy based on the same logic, not only they can survey, but they can also destroy. Uh, they have more firepower than most of the most advanced planes. If, and in addition, they are so cheaper, so much cheaper. The Predator operational cost uh, is about $4,000 per unit compared with the F-22, the most advanced, which is about $70,000 per unit an hour. And so it's, um, there is a tendency in which our superheroes of the Air Force are being uh, can replaced by kids, teenagers, recruited in the uh, video games uh, uh, arcades and working uh, from the Nevada desert, manipulating uh, drones all over the world. New tactics such as swarming, uh, composed by uh, tens of thousands of uh, coordinated and autonomous uh, drones able to uh, and rectify their course in, in, in the flight and, and cooperate with others are being developed. Now, all this means what in social terms? Not just technology. It means that we're, wars were never very human, but now we are in the process of dehumanizing wars. Wars without emotions. Wars being invisible. Wars that could be, at this point, uh, fought without victims on the side that control the technology 
and wars that remove further the logic of destruction from the logic of our social fabric and our minds. The more democratic institutions are in a crisis of legitimacy and the more uh, the network of bureaucracies at different levels that are now uh, in charge of the actual operation of our societies becomes autonomous and using autonomous machines. Moreover, state apparatuses tend to increase autonomy vis-a-vis -vis electoral politics and vis-a-vis -vis the political parties. Elected politicians are out of favor with the majority of public opinion and uh, the state in its diversity uh, increasingly control the continuity of public affairs. And the judicial system, which is not an elected system, uh, is becoming increasingly the site of power with increasing autonomy for the judicial authorities vis-a-vis uh, -vis the elected institutions of society. And furthermore, non-democratic states in these conditions, in these conditions of a structural crisis and crisis of legitimacy, are becoming more efficient to run affairs, to conduct the curse of the war. I'm thinking about China. And I don't think, knowing quite well China, I don't think that China has simply has uh, the ambition to dominate the world, certainly not militarily. It would be too costly and too destructive, and for what? The, the, their strategy is to uh, be hegemonic in, in economic and technological terms. Um, no, what I'm saying is that in the companion, the uh, increasing crisis of both legitimacy and efficiency of our democracies with the efficiency and regard and careless for uh, any democratic form of governance of uh, China in most of the world is becoming a reference that could represent an alternative to what had been liberal democracy for our world. And let me finish with a quick uh, reflection on um, how the logic of networks has been working and is, is still working the current multi-dimensional crisis that we are living through. The pandemics, but not only the pandemics, the pandemics and the associated um, economic crisis that is just starting in it, all its amplitude, and as well the crisis of legitimacy of governments facing uh, with the backlash of their citizens. At the root of these pandemics, as of many pandemics that have already happened in the last 15 years and will continue to happen is this, what I call the relationship between uh, network globalization and inhuman development, the forms of development which are based on the destruction of nature, the mega concentration in metropolitan areas when, with no services for large parts of the population and in which the uh, both the neoliberal ideology and the inability to uh, give priority to the social needs has created a crisis of the public in general, a crisis of the public services, and particularly a crisis in public health. Um, you know also that some, the, while we are concentrating on the effects of these pandemics, we also have uh, the devastating effects growing growingly of climate change that now people start considering and feeling 
that that's really a fundamental change that um, may create a condition for inability for us to inhabit the planet. Not the planet, the planet will be okay, will be perfect without us, as we may, may be destroying our habitat. Uh, so, how, and we know that the climate change scientists have established, there are connections between uh, pandemics, spread of viruses, and the destructions of the natural environment link to, uh, to climate change. And we know that what is the logic. What is a pandemic? A pandemic is, is, a, is a network process. A virus spread through networks, we know that, through networks of interpersonal contact. It's spread by air, physical contact, no other form. Air and physical contact and become more virulent by recurrent contact. So the notion here is to be global means that uh, we create global networks of interaction of everything, of people through global transport, transportation, uh, being traveling from one place to another and therefore any virus anywhere immediately, immediately can spread to everywhere. And because it's based on uh, air or uh, close contact, is no other way to uh, uh, stop it. So to some extent, a global digital base, which is transportation, macro network, induces at fast speed, multiple simultaneous micro networks of contact between humans. The only known remedy is to block the networks of personal interaction. That means on the one hand, confinement and how societies can be uh, systematically or recurrently under confinement is something that we still don't know. And, uh, and on the other hand means a return to block border crossing. We are provisionally halting the crisis in advanced countries uh, thanks to science. Again, uh, the, the same thing that we decry uh, in, in, in social networks is what is there to save us. Science for the moment producing vaccines at an unprecedented speed has been able to stop uh, the uh, relentless expansion of the virus. Really? Not in most of the world, not in most of the human population. Can we think that we can go on and overcome the pandemics by vaccinating North America and Europe and Australia and Canada and New Zealand? While at the same time, China has been able to, one, quickly, on the one hand, started in China and started because of the penetration of urbanization in the forest, etc., etc. You will not go into this unless you ask me. But on the other hand, in six months, through authoritarian measures of absence of contact on people and then closing the borders, has been able not only to stop the pandemics uh, before anyone else and restart economic growth and restart relatively normal life, but in isolation. Are we going toward that kind of wall? And can we think that uh, with the majority of the population across the Mediterranean or across the Mexican border, can we stop the process of vaccination there? Or simply use vaccines as sparingly as we can, waiting to see how the different countries react. In other words, in one word, we have, glo we have a globally interdependent world and we are trying to uh, retrench behind uh, fortress lines for those countries that are happy enough, able enough to um, control by themselves the pandemics. 
So, catastrophic events can only be avoided if we change social organization, this we know. Uh, because the regulatory crucial role of the state is still fundamental, but as a network state, as a state of that organizes the interactions between public authorities throughout the world. For the, for the time living, currently, life is being sustained by massive migration of activities to digital networks. And therefore, the, there is an acceleration of the digital transition to a fully networked operational structure that has enabled us to survive both physically and operationally the uh, heat of the pandemic. But uh, here, the logic of exclusion inclusion amplifies who is able to telework and who is not, who is able to maintain certain rights at telework in the teleworking world and who is not. On the other hand, the resistance of identities sharpen. Negationism is on the rise. In the United States, that they have vaccinated uh, the large majority of the population, but 25% of the population refuses vaccination. Much of it li linked to sectarian thinking, uh, millenarist thinking, and ignorance propagated by a combination of social networks and political Trumpism. In that sense, in contradiction to the global digital logic that already operates in the planet, in the midst of the crisis of legitimacy, the states try to impose their own territorial logic. The chaos that is being generated needs new understanding before we act or while we are acting more than ever there is a need for grounded theory grounded theory such as as a revamp network theory to understand and help a decomposing network society thanks for your attention thank you thank you very much uh, professor castells for, for that uh Illuminating talk, although I can't say that uh, I couldn't feel the, the gravity in, in, in that, pre that presentation. Uh, but we, we need to be hopeful, as, 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 as we got from the tone of your presentation. Thank you for that presentation that showed us that how the, the concept of network society, as you have been developing it for, for more than two decades, how it is still relevant. And this is really a nice punctuation at the very end of the conference and all the papers that we've had on your work dealing with the relevance and contemporary applications of it. And, and we have a perfect example of that from your own speech. So I'm going to use my position as Mad here and, and ask you the first question before I open it up to, to the audience. Um, so I, at ISTC, I uh, personally gave um, a series of lectures on your work where we dealt with different excerpts from the trilogy and from your book, uh, Communication Power. Uh, I had this with my third students, and there is one question that, that came up during the discussions in that class. And I promised them, once I had your confirmation that you'd be with us today, I promised my students that I'm going to ask this question to you personally. Um, so uh, you brushed on this at the beginning of your, uh, of your presentation. Uh, one of the core aspects of the concept of the network society as you develop it is the conflict between the net and the self. And, and, and you show us, uh, you've been showing us for, 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 for years now, that there is a conflict between the place, placeless character of networks on the one hand and the rooted, uh, I'm going to use your words, uh, rooted, with the rootedness of human meaning. Now, this was 25 years ago, you said it for the first time, and now you're telling us that not only is this still relevant today, because I was going to ask you, is, is it still relevant? Are, are, is human meaning still created at this at space of place and not the space of flows? And you're telling us that's not only still relevant, but there is an intensification of it. 
And now this, I can't help but wonder, if that's the case, and if there is an uh, intensification of identity production at the local level, uh, and we have the acceleration, as you put it, of digitalization of the space of flows, how can we imagine uh, the future of social movements. I know you don't like to do uh, uh, predictions, but I can't help, I, I need to ask you this. Uh, in countries in the Middle East, in North Africa, and I know the, you've written on them, on the Arab Spring, for example, where we have uh, the conflict between the net and the self on the one hand, and the possibility of global surveillance in non-liberal states, like in the Middle East and in North Africa, how can we imagine the future of social movements? Are we doomed or... If, if we want to have a, an element of hope, hope in that regard, where can we start? Thank, thank you, Maria, for such a fundamental question uh, that I can only uh, give justice uh, very briefly. Um, first of all, yes, the logic of the net and the self continues to be a fundamental one. I would simply uh, modify one thing that originally I I um, charge too much on, on one on the separation between the two. Uh, it's clear that now, um, with the spread of social media, a meaning, a different kind of meaning, can also be constructed in social media. It's not the same, but can be constructed in social media. And it's also possible that social media uh, express uh, identity values and express values simply that are in opposition to. Uh, the dominant values in the dominant network. And therefore, at this point, is is more networks against networks. So uh, the entire dynamic is network. So you have networks of domination, networks of resistance to domination. However, identity as a particular form of escaping the logic <coughs> of the uh, global networks is still and more than ever, a very powerful uh, counter power to uh, global networks. One of them, some of them are territorially located in terms of the creative meaning in a, in a world in which the institutions are less and less legitimized in the minds of the people is my neighbor, my family, um, to some extent, my local representatives which become more um, reliable, more trustable than the, these foreign powers, these global powers, uh, which, uh, to which I cannot relate anymore because the intermediation uh, has been lost. So on the one hand, uh, the significant part of the meaning, the production of meaning, yes, continues to be even more than before at the local, um, it's a small territorial level. But the, the principle of identity is not only local, it's a specific and particularly religious identity. And what we have seen in these last two decades is that on the one hand, the networking logic has become the dominant logic. On the other hand, the identity principle, uh, in particularly religious identity, but I would also say gender identity, for instance, has been decisive as a structure in social action, but a religious identity, uh, authentic or manipulated, has become a fundamental trend of our world. And particularly in the Muslim countries, uh, Northern Africa, the Middle East, we cannot understand the logic uh, you cannot understand these social movements and we cannot understand the deviation, in my view, of social movements toward the process of radicalization, as you call it in France, without the power of identity, the ident religious identity as a glue against the dissolving logic of all social ties by global networks. However, I would immediately add that this identity also has been built uh, on the basis of a new form of networks. So that's why the things are more complicated. 
And the theory cannot be simply the reproduction of what happened at one point, but seeing if the concepts and the logic of the theory can apply to new situations. And one of the new situations that can apply is the social movements that have started in, since basically 2010 in, in Tunisia, in Northern Africa, uh, Middle East, in which on the one hand, we see uh, social movements which are not based on religious identity, rooted in the uh, fight for human rights against dictatorship, against the globalization of uh, the economy, etc., and, and which were not religious. In fact, they integrated some religious components as part of the broader appeal to society. And on the other hand, in a very different movement, a religious identity movement, of which, which were network, but network globally on the basis of, of, of this identity, of which uh, Al Qaeda and the Islamic State, etc., had been a powerful, dramatic, and, and horrifying expression. Uh, and they are not the same. And what happens is that the political dictatorships in the Middle East have used the pretext of a global terrorism to crash with the help of the Western powers and Russia to crash fundamentally the social movements that were fighting for democracy. So that's why different networks, different logics, and ultimately the power of the state imposing itself both on the networks of hope that were creating in Paris Square and others, and as, as well as on the networks of terror that uh, which some of the religious identity process derived. Again, my point here, rather than going into the specifics now, this could be a wonderful uh, seminar, uh, is to show that the concepts that we have been proposing for a number of years can be operational to understand our thematic realities. For the, for the generous for the generous answer i have a lot of questions but i can't really abuse this position i see questions are coming in from the audience uh all right so we have a question from fisa uh, in amsterdam who is also a researcher and and she presented a talk with us yesterday um so fisa is asking uh it is an invisible process but could it be that the global north is slowly conquering the global south by colonizing the space of flows? The short answer is yes. Um, the, although the immediately trying to understand what, what we mean by colonization, um, because in, in, in empirical terms, what's happening is that the economies of the global south put aside it depends also on what we call the global south. China is not global south. It's not global south. It's global east with another logic. India is half and half. Um, but the fundamental thing is, um, if we take the financial markets, the economies of Latin America and Africa and most of, most of Asia and Middle East and Northern Africa uh, are uh, dominated by the global financial markets, which are dominated by logics and actors that clearly are rooted, even if they are not exactly uh, the set of corporations, but they are networked between the corporation and rooted in the traditional forms of uh, Western capitalism and Japan. That's clearly the case. And if we uh, refer to that, yes, the economies of the global South are largely dependent from the economies of from the financial markets which are largely dependent from the corporations in the global north also in technology also in technology that's very important uh, technology and particularly network technologies and communication technologies are absolutely fundamental for everything when i don't have to elaborate on that and this is clearly the ability to research, design, sell, and control 
um, communication technologies in the north is without parallel to the south, and therefore this technological dependency is one of the most important. So that's why, yes, the answer is yes, and it's very difficult to reverse when uh, domination doesn't take the form of traditional colonialism to insert against uh, the, the palace of the media of the colonial governor is easier than to insert against the space of flows. That answer. Uh, I have another one uh, from Anna. Anna, who is in St. Petersburg, also a panelist yesterday, and she's thanking you for, for, the, for the great talk. Um, and she's asking you basically to share your thoughts about the concept of global public sphere. Uh, and she's asking, is it a theoretical illusion or rather an invisible place of all flows? All right. Well, this is not my concept, of course, but it's a concept that I find useful. And, and I think we should always uh, uh, judge concepts not by, by, by who says or what, but uh, if we find it useful or, or not. Uh, in one word, uh, public sphere refers, as the Habermasian concept originally, refers to uh, the actual debate that can be translated into uh, democratic institutional action. Because there is the political deb debate uh, is in the institutions, and then the public sphere is how society, through mechanisms of debate, dialogue, and participation, uh, creates ideas, exchanges views, and ultimately proposes uh, the uh, projects from society for these processes to be taken into consideration in the institutional setting. So, but what happens when we have a global society, network society, with great differences between countries, but it's still global in the sense that citizens of the world are linked into their dreams and their nightmares and, and, and they are link into the project that the, the development. So, in that particular case, the social media have become the actual manifestation of the global public sphere. Because again, public sphere is the, where the debates take place. Uh, since the debates close into the institutions, let's say, in the cultural clubs, in the in the foundations that are very, very limited in our societies. Uh, the debates take place as in the uh, social media networks and in the, in the media which are connected to the social media networks. And here is the, the, the two difficulties with this. On the one hand, yes, there is a global public sphere, which is the global social media network that discussions. On the, on the other hand, um, the public sphere, to be truly public, needs to relate to the political institutional sphere. That's the heart of the Habermasian theory. And, and there are no global political institutions, period. And therefore, I mean, the United Nations is not a, a supranational uh, institution is a co-national institution dominated by the nation state governments. So therefore, the, the debate, the dialogue, the exchanges in the global civil society in, in which social movements are also a part, are a part, they are social movements, but they also the social movements go through the social media that are where the debate and the dialogue takes place. But the majority of the, of the communication is what this um, cacophony of multiple uh, actors, ideas, and, and destruction of truth and assault of reason, which pollute this potential global public sphere. So it's a public sphere Yes, it's a global 
How do you see it? Yes. But unlike being an instrument of uh, citizen democracy and enlargement of the process of production of ideas and proposals in the uh, utopian Habermasian uh, Beckian uh, view, in fact, this global public sphere is more and more an instrument of confrontation, negationism, and assault on reason. Thank you, Professor Castells, for that answer. Uh, I had promised Professor Castells that we're not going to be abusing his, 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 uh, his, his grace and, and, and generosity. So I'll just take two more questions. I know, Pierre, you, maybe you have a question for Professor Castells, and then I'll take one from the audience as well. Please go ahead. Professor, I, I just would like to ask a, a simple question, um, not as an expert of uh, the concept that I'm unfortunately not, but just as a French citizen. Uh, we have tomorrow here in France uh, um, an election, and the last elections probably revealed, uh, have probably revealed that um, the way we institutionalize um, elections is not really adequate to, uh, to the forms of communication we have right now. Uh, what do you think about this question? Well, uh, clearly, it's uh, not only in France, but in, in, in Europe in general, there is a, an increasing gap between the forms of communication and the, and the institutions and processes of political representation. Uh, which continue to be uh, from the 19th century. Uh, and uh, yes, it doesn't mean that, that politicians and political activists have not learned how to use social media. But one thing is to use them. The other thing is to understand the logic, the language of these social media. To some extent, the advantage of social movements uh, in the last uh, 10 years in many countries has been that being generally enacted by a new generation who are who understand who who are citizens of of this new media world the advantage of these activists over politicians is huge it's huge uh, so politicians think that by by hiring a few of these youngsters um, they can get out of the process it's not so. For instance, one critical thing, the fact that everybody has a mobile phone with uh, video capabilities and ability to immediately transmit to the internet means that whatever a politician says or does, even in his private life, can be immediately in the public domain. They have not adapted to that. And the only adaptation is that they are hiding more and more, except under highly controlled situations and with surrounded by bodyguards. So the direct political contact between leadership and people is diminishing, diminishing. And the, uh, while on the other hand, if we think about the possibilities of what social media and internet-based communication offers are extraordinary. We could have public forum. We could have debates with full participation. We can have full interaction. We can have citizen participation in government uh, decisions with the uh, ability to both express opinions, uh, construct forms of interaction. Could be not direct democracy, it could be an enlarged form of democracy using this new form of technological uh, enablement uh, for political participation. So uh, I, I quite agree with the, what is implicit in your question. The politicians and political institutions live in an age which does not correspond to the digital communication age which is where most people live, including uh, people of certain age, which are more advanced people than politicians in this case. Thank you, thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Kazez, and thank you, Piero, for that, for that question. I know I had said that I'd take one more question from the audience, but I think it wouldn't be fair to Professor Castells. So um, in the name of, uh, on behalf of our institute, my colleagues and the audience, I want to thank you, Professor Castells, for, for, for being with us and for giving us a part, a good chunk of your, 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 your Saturday afternoon, and we're grateful for that. I'm going to use this opportunity to formally uh, conclude our conference, but before I do that, I know Camilla, my co-organizer would like to come up perhaps and, and say a few things. Camila, are you there? Is que tu souhaites, uh, who is uh, from Chile and probably she would like to thank you in Spanish as well, Professor. So thank you very much, all of you. I was very happy to participate in this interaction. And uh, uh, seriously speaking, what you are doing is what we need at this point. We need to rethink our world, even with the concepts that have been produced uh, in other moments. Thank you and goodbye. Muchísimas gracias, you, profesor. Muchísimas gracias. Chao, gracias. Nos deja mucho que pensar y reflexionar para para la, el próximo encuentro. Esperamos que sea Lil y poder invitarlo personalmente a venir a Lil. Gracias, Camila. Saludos cordiales. Mehdi, je te laisse la parole si tu veux finir. Uh, C'est à toi, Camila. C'est à toi. Donc, uh, n'hésite pas à ah, oui, je voudrais remercier euh, les, les participants, les professeurs et toi surtout pour l'organisation, pour, pour cette euh, super présentation que tu as fait, pour guider les questions. J'ai vu qu'il y avait pas mal de gens qui ont, qui ont laissé des questions euh, à, à répondre, mais je pense que ça, ça nous motive à continuer ce travail et, et à, à continuer à réfléchir sur les théories qui, comme ils disaient les professeurs, ont été possibles il y a quelques années, mais qui nous font, nous sont une matrice pour réfléchir et actuellement. Donc c'est hyper intéressant, c'est très motivant et stimulant. Et, et je pense qu'il que, qu y, y a des gens qui seraient intéressés pour continuer à, à, dans ces réflexions-là. Euh, tu as bien raison de souligner ça, Camilla, et euh, le message d'encouragement qu'on qu vient d'avoir euh, de la part de, de M. Castells à la fin, je pense que ça, ça nous... Euh, Uh, thank you, Camilla. Is uh, could you switch? Uh, no, okay, all right. So um, switch switch back to English because I I was supposed only to speak English. Uh, so this brings us to the end of our three day conference, the Network Society Reevaluations and Applications. And I think it is only befitting um, to hear the final word on the Network Society from Professor Castells himself. And we are really thankful for that. We really wish, as I said on Thursday. We could have welcomed you all here in person. And we hope to be able to welcome you here in Lille uh, in the post-pandemic world, fingers crossed, that's going to be soon. We are grateful for your rich proposal, presentations, and the fascinating discussions we had uh, after each of the six panels and the keynote uh, lecture. And thank you for the questions to, to, to the audience. I wish to thank each and every one of you, uh, of our panelists, who joined us from and this time we're going to get this right, South Korea, Romania, Morocco, China, Turkey, Spain, Serbia, Russia, Hong Kong, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Cameroon, as well as our colleagues from our dear uh, Université Catholique de Lille. Uh, I want to thank all the people who joined the sessions and participated in the discussions, and my gratitude yet again to our esteemed keynote speaker, whose presence at the conference gave, gave it completely a different dimension. I thank you all for being part of our very first international conference, the first of, man, of many more to come, I hope. Uh, also, we would uh, love for this conference to be a launching pad uh, for uh, future partnerships and joint projects. So we would be very happy to consider collaborations with your respective research centers. So please uh, feel free to write to me and, and I, I definitely look into it. Uh, that would be my privilege. I wish to thank my colleagues here at ISTC who have been working hard to make sure the technology works uh, smoothly and that all the material and psychological uh, support stay optimal. Most notably, I'm thinking of Sylvain Razmo, uh, the man behind the scenes of each of our panels and virtual sessions, including this one right now, and uh, Pura Turki, who is uh, my co-panelist today. Uh, the managing director of our institute for his support and availability despite the very busy week that you had this week and I'm, I, I'm, I know about that. A special word of thanks to my dear colleague and friend Camilla Perez-Lagos, 
my co-organizer, co who, whose work has been invaluable in organizing the conference. Muchas gracias, uh, Camila. As I said on Thursday, Camila and myself are organizing the post-conference publication. All the dates and necessary information are included in the conference brochure. I think it's page 17, uh, and it's bilingual. So you have it in French and you have it in, uh, in English. The final papers will go through a rigorous peer review uh, by our scientific committee, whom I also want to thank uh, once again for their generosity and kindness uh, toward our center. Final note, if any of the panelists need a conference uh, attendance certificate, please contact me and I will be happy to pr provide you with one to, to demonstrate to your respective institutions. Mesdames et messieurs, chers collègues, merci à toutes et à tous et à très bientôt.